back to work. I got my coffee. Then we'll, we'll, we'll get started. Let some people get on here anyways. Thanks. Only the second live I've ever done. Second live I've ever done. I don't generally like doing lives because I like to be very specific about the things that I say. And I find that sometimes when I say something about dog training, I go back and I say to myself, you know, uh, I, I think I could have said this better or I missed something in that explanation. And that's the problem when you speak off the cuff. Sometimes you say things in a way that you wish you could have said in a little bit of a, a better manner. So, we're going to get to some questions. Because I know some of you guys have questions, reasonable questions. Not, my dog misbehaves, how do I make him behave? Well, there's an essay to be, to be had on that. So, unfortunately, you know, they've got to be a little bit specific. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some of the things that we've got going on. So, um, hopefully I can, uh, I'll see all the comments as you guys make them, and then I'll try and respond as I can, and then we'll go from there. So, I hope the audio is good, guys. If it's not good, let me know in the comments, and um, uh, we'll, we'll operate like that. Uh, I guess I'll start while we're waiting for some people. Where's the live chat? There we go. I can see your car. Hello. Aloha. Okay. All right, guys. I can see everything now, so we're going to get started. Um, talk a little bit about some of the news before I get going. And then... Uh, I'm uh, going to talk about some of the news before I get going. And then... Um, uh, by the time we got everybody on here, I'll try to answer some of these questions. I can already see a couple good questions um, that, that, that might interest a whole bunch of people. So, so we're going to get to all of that. Um, first of all, uh, the big thing that we got going on right now, and I've alluded to it before, is we're shooting the... Hey, guys. We're shooting um, online training. So I know that on this YouTube channel. Initially, when I did and started this YouTube channel, you got to understand, this YouTube channel was a portfolio. I didn't start this YouTube channel to get followers. I just started it to actually have proof of work, right? So all the things that I did, whether it's protection dog, whether it's obedience training, whatever it was, tracking, I just wanted a portfolio of my work, and that's what this YouTube channel was. Um, and then, uh, you know, sometimes I would post informational videos a couple times I promote, I, I posted some instructional videos. Some of my best posting happened when uh, some folks annoyed me um, because then I said, okay, you know, I'm going to put some free stuff out there. And I'll explain that a little bit. So, you know, I've had, I've had some employees over the years and I went through a period of time a few years ago where um, people would come back before I was smart <laughs> or smarter, I should say. People would come and, uh, you know, they'd do like six months with me and then they'd run off, take what they had gathered in six months and, you know, started their, you know, own business. And, you know, I always had a saying, I, I didn't like that because I felt like, number one, they weren't properly representing me. They were using my name, not with my permission, but they were using my name, right? And saying, you know, that they had gotten this information from me and basically just trying to springboard off my name to build their own little you know uh, dog training thing and I never and and their work wasn't very good because how good can you be you know basically just copying something for for a few months right so that's some some folks annoyed me and I was like you know what I'm gonna put this stuff out properly so that people can get this information properly so they don't have to take these people's words for it anyways that I, I shot some really popular videos when when that happened just because I started putting the stuff out for free but then I was like you know what my YouTube channel has become like a hobby I just post stuff like if I'm interested in something or if I'm doing some training and I think it's interesting and I want to talk about it I talk about it it's not very systemic though 
Like, I don't do, like, a lot of step one, step two, step three. I've, I do them, but not that much, right? So, what I, what I decided was I'm going to make a video series of my entire training system from top to bottom. I'm going to talk to people about, you know, I'm going to show people how to make an off-leash dog. I'm going to show show people how to do competition training, how to do protection training, how to do tracking. I'm going to show everybody everything, and but I'm going to do it properly. And I said, okay, I'm going to obviously, you're not going to do that for free. That's an enormous undertaking, as I'm finding out. Um, but it will be coming out the end of July 2020, uh, sorry, 2021. We're going to be putting these videos out, um, some of them, and then I'm going to just keep adding to them. Um, and uh, it's going to be available for everybody. Anybody who wants to sign up to get access to these videos, you're going to get step by step. You're not going to have to go through my channel and piece things together. You're going to get it step by step. At the same time, I'm going to keep posting stuff on the channel, same same way that I'm doing it now, where if I'm interested in something, I'll post it on the channel, and, and then we'll go from there. So that's the big news anyways. Um, now I'm going to kind of go through some of your questions, and, and uh, we're going to go like that. So, catchy, what should I do when my dog not in mood to train? Well, there's no such thing. It depends what you're doing, right? So are you doing positive training? Are you doing competition training? What kind of training are you doing? That has an impact on what you should be doing. So for competition training, for of training, I need to develop a lot of motivation within the dog. Whatever it is that I'm selling the dog to get the dog to work for me, whether it's food, a ball, whatever it is, I need to make sure that the dog is in a high state of desire for that thing. If the dog isn't, then I need to take steps to help the dog be in that place where they're in a high state of desire. If you notice in my competition training, my dogs are always in a, in, a, in a very aroused state. I can't get them off me. They're climbing me all the time. They're, they're always functional training. There's no such thing as life together, all right? For functional training, there's no such thing as a mood. I tell you to do it, you do it. I'm going to show you how to do it. I'm going to try to make it rewarding for you. But it's not something where you know, if you feel like doing it, I'm not doing it. So I hope that kind of makes sense, and I hope that, that, that helps you. You know, when somebody brings me their pet dog to train, I just train. Now, if he says, okay, I'm really excited to do this, I want to work, I say, great, bonus. I'm going to make this as rewarding for you as possible. If he no problem, and, you know, I, like I said, I have a no dog left behind policy. I've never had a dog come to me for training, and I say, well, he doesn't really want to do it, so we're not going to do it. It doesn't work like that. Right? And that's if you're going to become a dog trainer, that's something that you have to understand. It's like you have to get every dog to a level. If people can believe that you're going to do that for their dog, whether the dog is food motivated or not. So many trainers, dog's not food motivated. They can't do anything with the dog. Well, you're not really a dog trainer then. You're a dog, you're a dog briber. All right? That's what you are. So we have to, depends what we're doing with the dog. All right. How long do I train each day? Depends what I'm doing. So generally... Um, if I'm doing functional training, like there's there's training and then there's training, right? Am I training for competition work? My competition dog probably between tracking, obedience, and protection, if I'm doing all three phases in a day, that dog is probably getting maybe an hour and a bit of training every day. But realistically, I take Saturdays off. I don't train on Saturdays, and I don't do three phases a day. So realistically, that dog probably gets about 45 minutes of training a day. Now, if I'm doing functional training, for me, my functional training is actually relatively quick. My functional training system, I have a dog completely off-leash trained between four and six weeks, okay? Maybe training about an hour, an hour a day, give or take. Yeah, so that's that's how much training I do per day. It's not about length of time. It's about the quality of the repetitions and your ability to communicate effectively with the dog. If you can do those things, it's not, you know, this multi-year process that a lot of people think it is. In terms of distance, distraction, duration, is there any order? Yes, there is. Um, first of all, you're missing one thing. It's not distance, dista um, distraction, and duration. The most important thing is that the dog actually gets to where... And by that I mean, 
when I teach a dog to sit or to down, I'm not worried about how long the dog can do it and the distractions. I'm worried about how the dog can get to the sit. Can the dog get to the sit? If the dog can't get to the sit, I'm not worried about distraction, duration, etc. I call it behavioral transition. Sit down, heel, whatever it is you're doing. I want a dog that can transition effortlessly into the behavior and out of the behavior, all right? Before I ever add distance, duration, distraction. Then after that, usually I make it a little bit of duration. Then I make, um, you know, the distractions. I always train usually in heavy distractions. Like if I, I don't avoid distractions in my training. It's not a big deal for me. Um, you know, I'll put pressure on the dog if he tries to uh, engage with the distraction promote the uh, engagement with me and then I just we just go through it in the dog learns like for if you've ever come to shield canine you know we don't have a huge training room our training room oftentimes there's four or five dogs in that room you know and and they're all like relatively new half of them are usually aggressive dogs or reactive dogs and we train like that you know right from day one they learn the rules you know it's like you're not allowed to engage with distractions you must uh, focus on the handler it's not an option what do I think of the dogo? Well, I've trained a few dogos in my time. I think like many breeds, it's overhyped. Uh, and by that, I mean there's a lot of people that want to like paint them as like this like mythical kind of beast. Um, most of them are fearful. Um, you know, some of them have skin issues. Um, I think for the most part, they're bred very poorly. Uh, their nerves aren't very good. Uh, oftentimes, drives aren't very good. Um, and that goes for a lot of breeds, you know, Dobermans, Mastiffs, uh, it, it's it's terrible to see what it's become. Maybe it was never great in the first place. I don't know. I wasn't there from the get-go. You know, I find with a lot of these breeds, people have like a, a very overly hyped perception of what the dogs are. I've trained a lot of these types of dogs. And, um, you know, in many cases, these dogs struggle with, with, with fear, um, you know, oversensitivity, so on and so forth. So if you're, you're looking to get a dogo to do protection work, be very, very careful where you go. Make sure you're going somewhere where you can see multi, multiple generations um, doing that work. Otherwise, you might be sorely disappointed, end up with a big, beautiful, scared little dog on the end of your leash, which is what most people end up with when they go to the Mastiffs um, and, and a lot of these dogs, to be quite frank. Uh, big fan of the channel. Thanks. Appreciate that, guys. Appreciate all the love. How do you build drive in dogs that are intelligent but not generally considered easily trainable? Drive is not based on intelligence. It's either there or it's not. You don't have to be smart to want to eat. You don't have to be smart, you know, to want to fight. Whatever kind of drive you can think of in humans, right? It has nothing to do with intelligence. It either is or it is not. So, if the drive is there, you have a dog who kind of likes the ball but doesn't like love the ball you can do things like like i have a, a video on 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 building the ball drive you know where i kick ball around and kind of withhold it from the dog i build frustration and i make it very rewarding when the dog gets the ball it's things like this you can do again you know you're getting a breed a chow a husky these dogs are not bred for this type of stuff like you can, a lot of people want to go racing and they don't have a race car you have to be realistic about what you have you know, so I get all the time people, I got a Husky, I want to do protection work. Well, you got a Husky. We'll get a proper dog to do protection work and we'll do it. You know, I personally, I'm not one of these guys that's going to waste time, you know, fooling around with it with a, an off-breed that's not completely not meant to do something. I'm not getting a Neapolitan Mastiff to go um, dog sledding, right? This doesn't make any sense. So, the dogs are bred a certain way for a reason. And it's not about the breed, it's about the individuals. I always say this to people. Right? You have to go to, to breeders that are breeding within that breed for a specific so I'll give you an example. The German Shepherd. Most people think any German Shepherd will do for guard and protection work, for police work, whatever. No, it won't. You need to go to people breeding specifically, working like dogs. And within the subset of working like dogs, there's people breeding working like dogs for pet. There's people breeding them, you know, um, for service work, for all sorts of silly things, right? That have really nothing to do with the actual purpose of the dog. And then there's breeding programs that are successful and breeding programs that are not successful. So when you say, I want my dog to do X, go and find the breeder that's making the dog their dogs do X and doing it well. That's another thing, doing it well, not just doing it. Listen, there's a lot of people involved in dog sport, for instance, 
that they don't do very well with their dogs. They get the dogs through the titles and they love the sport, so on and so forth, but the dogs are not excelling in the sport. Why would you buy a dog like that? I will go to the breeder whose dogs are doing very well in the sport, who are con consistently in the championships or the top handlers are using. This is the type of breeder whose, whose dogs I'm gonna be buying for whatever it is that I'm doing. And if it's a real world application, working application like hunting or something, I'm going to the breeder whose, whose dogs are hunting and who's, who are doing well, who have proven results, both in the competition and in the real world. This is for whatever it is that you wanna do with dogs. Uh, for working breeds, what age is best for imprinting personal protection? Well, generally for me, I don't do any protection work until after uh, the dog is done teething. So dogs are not done teething uh, until about six, six and a half months. That's usually when I'll start. And I'll start very light kind of stuff. My protection program is a little bit different. Look, I got videos on my channel on protection training. Everything from crypt development, you know, safe things that you can do with a puppy where you've back tied the puppy and you're working with the rag and stuff like this. Grip development, man work, all that type of stuff. I don't really start uh, until, like I said, six, seven months. I just check a few times, make sure that the dogs, the drives are developing, that they're there. But I know that there's really nothing I'm going to do personally that's gonna make it more or less likely that the dog's gonna do protection um, early. And there's not many, pr much productive things you can do at an early age, in my opinion. I wait until six, seven months before I really start doing any protection training with the dogs. And again, you have to know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, they're gonna mess things up. Go to someone who knows what they're doing. Shout out from Pakistan. Thanks, man, appreciate it. Struggling with Royal Cannon. Well, guess what, I feed Royal Cannon. I feed um, Royal Cannon and raw food. Um, I, I supply raw power here, and raw power is made by, by my good friend James. Um, I feed a lot of my breeding dogs raw, but I also feed Royal Cannon and specifically Yukonuba. So Yukonuba and Royal Cannon are the same company. I believe Yukonuba is like the grain free version. I like them both. I've, I've used Royal Cannon. Never had a problem with Royal Cannon. Never had a problem with Yukonuba. I've been to a lot of other dog foods. I've, I've been on the Purinas and they changed their formula. I didn't like the formula. I've done the Inukshuk. Didn't like the Inukshuk both times I tried it. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've tried a whole bunch of dog foods and really the one that's worked the best for me has been Yukonuba and Royal Cannon, which like I said already, same company. Uh, I really like, I like their food. I use their food and, and I also uh, feed raw, raw power, which I get from James Silva. They have an Instagram page. You can look them up and we carry their food here. I'm an active individual living alone and I've got four to five friends around most of the time. I've owned several show line German Shepherds in the past. Congratulations. Uh, any way to ask for some training videos with a dog not as sharp as a shepherd? I've got a one-year-old Rottweiler that is nothing like a Malinois puppy. Well, uh, if you go back on my channel, you'll see some training videos with a Presa Canario puppy. So, uh, those are fairly similar to Rottweilers in their behavior. Uh, I know Huskies aren't really protective. No. <laughs> what do you think of the Kohler method of dog training? I've never, I've read a little bit of it just out of curiosity because everybody was kind of clutching their hearts on the Kohler method and being all, you know, oh, it's terrible, right? So, anyways, I read, I read a little bit of it. I found some of it interesting. I found some of it to be amusing, and I think for the time it was a radical piece of very simple dog training. Um, methodology that almost anybody with a half decent amount of common sense could do. So for the time it was revolutionary. Um, I think that when you're doing things as you do in the caller method of dog training, you have to have a sense of being able to read the dog. You have to have some level of common sense and you have to be an ethical person. And what I mean, I know people are like, oh, caller ethics? People assume being ethical when it comes to dog training is is just uh, never wanting to do anything aversive to the dog. And in my opinion, this is the farthest thing from ethical. That's not ethical at all. Aversive 
involving aversives in your training in a way that makes sense to the dog, right, are, are a big part of actually training the dog in a functional way, training the dog to be safe, to be stable, uh, helping the dog if they have any behavioral issues, um, you know, any unproductive genetic, uh, you know, uh, based behavior, so on and so forth. You need to use aversives. But what I mean by ethical is that you also need to be able to recognize whether the dog is acting in a way that requires you to use the aversive in that moment or whether you're frustrated, whether you've been lazy, whether you haven't done the right thing and the dog is legitimately confused because of that, if that makes sense. All right, there's probably a better way to say it. Like I said before when I started this live, you know, the reason I don't like lives is because there's always a better way to say things and I like to say things in the, in the best way I could possibly think of, especially when it comes to things like using aversives. I use a lot of aversives in my dog training but I use them as intelligently as possible and I use them in a way that makes sense to the dog so that the dog is very clear on what is and what is not. So the Kohler method of dog training was revolutionary for its time. I think modern dog training has progressed past it, um, but I think there are some fundamental principles in it that still are true to this day. I have prior training experience with show lines. I'm still in college thinking of getting a working line. Go for it. <laughs> I have a three-month-old Kenna Corso growling and biting sometimes when outside. I can't alpha roll her. Of course you can't alpha roll. Well, you could, but it's not a good idea. I, I, I don't believe in, I don't ever, hey guys, this is a, new, this is a story. I, ver, I don't believe in alpha rolling, right? Like I don't think it's very effective. I just don't do it. So, you know, if that's your go-to, go for it, but that's not what I do. Um, you know, three-month-old puppy, usually when I hear about a three-month-old puppy misbehaving, um, quite frankly, the owners are just not very familiar with dog behavior, and, you know, the puppy's offering a lot of very normal behaviors for its age, and they're overreacting to it. So, seek professional help. Mm, pulling the ear a bit. Yeah, of course she growled. You're, you're causing an aversive. When you do something aversive to the puppy, the puppy has two choices. The puppy can be suppressed by what you're doing or the puppy can become more active and fight, okay? And a lot of puppies, especially certain breeds, are more prone to do the other thing. So when they do that, if you don't have another level, if your aversive only goes to a certain place and the puppy is able or the dog is able to go up above that, you, you better have another level to your game. Otherwise, you know, that dog is going, you're actually going to make the dog aggressive. You're going to teach the dog that the response to pressure is to be aggressive. This is where a lot of people with the pinch collars and the e-collars, they screw up because they try to correct the dog, whether it's with the pinch collar and e-collar with your hand, whatever it is you're doing, you try to correct the dog for something you don't like. And the dog says, you know what? That's not enough for me. I'm going to escalate. I'm going to take it to another level. I'm going to correct you for correcting me. Now, if you don't have another level to go and say, no, no, that doesn't work, man. It's not going to fly. Then the dog is going to win and you're going to teach the dog to be actually be aggressive towards you. And I deal with a lot of clients who have accidentally done this. So be very careful. If you don't know how to use aversives, go to a professional who will help you. It's kind of like if you have a kid and you say to the child, you must go in the corner. You've misbehaved. You're going to, the, you're going to take a time out in the corner. And the kid says, no, I'm not going to. And you say, okay, no, you have to go to the corner. And the kid comes over and slaps you. What's your next level? If you don't have a next level, the kid's going to learn every time you try to correct him or tell him to go to take his time out, he just needs to come and slap you and you'll be quiet, right? What is the difference between real aggression and fear, fear aggression? So this is the problem that a lot of people have. There are dogs that are bred to have a high level of natural defense. And that defense is a source of power and arousal that they're able to channel into their protection work, okay? Now, a lot of dogs are just flat out afraid, okay? Now, you could say both of those things originate from the same place, but what's the response to fear, right? Fight, flight, or freeze. So most, most dogs fall into 
flight or freeze. Now, a lot of people accidentally turn freeze or flight into fight, right? Because that dog is on a leash and he can't really run away. Here's the thing, right? A lot of dogs, um, you know, they learn to bluff. They learn to make a big scene and people think that the dog is being protective when really the dog is just completely scared. And if you ever push the envelope, the dog is going to go into complete flight. A dog that has true defensive aggression, like a working breed that's been bred to be like this, that, that you know, can be can be actually used in the protection work by a skilled decoy. This is a dog who his natural response to that insecurity that he feels is actually fight. And it's a real fight. It's not woo, woo, woo. It's forward, it's aggressive, and his intention is to engage. All right? And a lot of the time, these dogs, like for instance, Gage, okay? So Gage, I say he's a truly defensive dog. Sorry, guys, I'm just going to fix something here. Okay. Gage is a truly defensive dog. Okay, like he has a, a true defensive aggression. It's not fear aggression. He has defensive aggression. Okay, he also has a lot of prey drive, which helps because it makes the transition from the defensive aggression into the prey very easy for him because he has a lot of na natural prey and he likes to be in the prey, right? His default response to something that, you know, like somebody jumping out of the bushes and stuff is not prey. His default response to that is the defensive aggression, har, 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 right? that and then what we're looking to do is we're looking to take the dog from that defensive place into an into the prey where you get the superior biting where you get a dog who's forward where you get a dog who's 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 very offensive okay most of these dogs that have true defensive aggression become offensive on their own really with age two three years old the dog is a force to be reckoned with right but they can do some funky things in the bite work those are the dogs that come off the sleeve try to bite you in the face try to bite your legs stuff like this if you if they haven't been trained properly so fear aggression is something that most dogs have true defensive aggression that is actually a very strong source of power in the protection work is something that you'll generally see in well-bred german shepherds from specific lines um it's not very common, so you won't see a lot of it. Most of it's fear, and and it's kind of hard to explain exactly the difference. When you've worked a lot of dogs and you've trained a lot of dogs, you will know. Uh, do you use an e-collar on high correction level that is aggressive out of fear for protection? What? Um, no. I don't use the e-collar to punish, to punish fear. I, I don't, you, like, you can't punish fear. That's what you have to understand, right? What you can do is you can punish aversive, um, sorry, un, uh, cop, poor, poor, so if a dog has fear, like I said already, the dog has the choice, flight, freeze, um, or fight, right? A lot of dogs develop poor coping mechanisms to fear. So you can punish a poor coping mechanism, but then you're still left with the fear. If you don't know how to deal with the fear and you don't know how to show the dog how to cope properly, you're actually going to cause more problems. Um, and I don't use the e-collar generally for this. The e-collar for me is, a pr is primarily an obedience tool. It is not something that I slap on the dog and shock him when he's doing things I don't like, especially in the beginning. It's, that's a bad idea. Are you ever in NorCal doing seminars? Have me down, man. If you have me down, I'll do it. Um, right now, the borders are closed, but hopefully by fall, the borders are going to be open and we'll be able to go back and forth between the U.S. and Canada uh, easily again. Any other trainers that put out good content you approve of? Well, I'm a big believer in going to as many sources as you can, credible sources, to get information. So, I think that you shouldn't just stick with one discipline. Um, I, I'm going to suggest you guys look up the following people. Ivan Balabanov. Don Sullivan. Marco Cosconsalo. Those are three people I suggest you look up. You're going to see some things that are a little bit different. Ooh, Bart Bellon. Look him up too. You're going to see some things that are a little bit different. Some of these guys that I'm talking about, if you're brand new 
Oh, Michael Ellis. Look him up. It's a good introduction to marker training, stuff like this. Um, some of these guys are a little bit difficult if you're brand new to dog training. But like they're, they're guys that you appreciate if you're on a bit of a higher level. Some of these guys are, are very uh, uh, newbie friendly. But look them up. It's good to get a, 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 a very wide range of people. But I like to look for people that have, have achieved a level of excellence in their work. Um, the one guy who's not like the others is Don Sullivan. Look up Don Sullivan. Don Sullivan is an excellent example of old school training done right with proven results. Do you use food and training without it becoming, how do you use food and training without it becoming a bribe? Well, in the beginning, I use food to shape behavior if the dog wants to eat. It depends what I'm doing, right? Generally with my personal dogs, they all like to eat. Um, you know, I personally don't like dogs without food drive. That being said, in my, in my business practice, we get tons of dogs that come in that have very little to no food drive. So for these dogs, the food is useless. If the dog doesn't want to eat, you cannot use it, right? And, and by that, I mean, if I give the dog a piece of food and I say, here, here's the cookie, and he eats the cookie and he kind of goes, and then he kind of like spits it, it's useless. I'm not going to train with the food. Now, if he eats the cookie like, bah, and he like practically takes my, my hand off, I say, okay, this is useful for me now. In the beginning, I shape with the food. I show the dog, follow the food, get what you want, right? I shape behavior, I shape positions, I, I, I reward the dog for desirable behavior with the food, but I don't just make it about the food. This is the mistake a lot of people make. They just give the food, right? Here's your, here's your cookie, all done. That's not how it works. For me, I make the act of taking the food extremely rewarding. It's a game, come on, get the food, get the food, get the food. The food, taking the food is almost like a game for the dog. So the interaction between me and the dog and the food become very rewarding. Have you ever watched me play with a ball with a dog? I've got like maybe five, six dogs on my channel who I'm playing with a ball with, maybe more even, maybe like 10 of them. You'll notice if you watch those dogs, me and the ball, it's always the same behavior. The dog hammers into me with the ball. He's climbing all over me with the ball in his mouth. Why is he doing that? He's got the ball. He doesn't need me anymore. He's learned that me and the ball together are way more fun than just him and the ball by himself. That's something I created by not just saying, here's your ball, we're all done. I said, here's your ball, bring it to me, we'll have fun together. And I did that over and over and over again. And I never let him go away to self-satisfy with the ball or with the food by himself. It was always a me and him thing, right? If you teach a dog like this, then after a while, it'll stop being just about the food. Okay, and then of course you have to fade it as you get as you get uh, uh, farther along in the training, and this is where the the use of also aversives come in. If you're just relying on motivation in your training, well, guess what? At some point you're going to run into a time when the dog's either not hungry or he's not overly motivated to do what you want him to do. He's more motivated by the environment. I always say to people, imagine it like this: you're a 18 year old boy, 16 year old boy, even worse. The hormones are crazy at that age. For those of you that have never been a 16 year old boy, it sucks, believe me, all right? So you're in a field. In one corner of the field, there are a dozen supermodels, okay? They're all beckoning, hey, come over here, come over here, we wanna talk to you, we wanna, we wanna hold your hand, whatever, okay? In the other corner of the field, there's 10 of the coolest video game consoles and the TV and all this type of stuff, okay? And then in the third corner of the field, there's all your favorite foods. And then in the fourth corner of the field, there's your mom. And your mom has made you your favorite cookie or her cookies or whatever. And you like her cookies, but now you're saying, okay, I like mom. I like mom's cookies, but I got supermodels. I got those super cool video games. And then I've got, um, you know, all those food that I don't normally get. What do you think that kid's going to pick? Of course, he's going to make one of those three choices. He's gonna, hey, mom, I'll see you later. I love you, mom, but I'll see you later. I'll have those cookies tonight. I'm not eating them right now. I got things to do. That's your dog. Okay? That's your dog when you take them out in public. So this is where the averse is. Hey, 
mom says, listen, listen, little Johnny, I know there's supermodels. I know there's video games. I know there's pizza over there. Mommy has her cookies here and mommy would like to give you the cookie. But if you don't come, mommy is going to rain down thunder upon you. Oh, damn. Okay. Well, you know what? I do love mom. Let me go see mom. Right? That's what it's got to be. It can't always be just the cookies. And if you make it just the cookies, then that's all it'll be. And a lot of dog trainers, unfortunately, they do this. I love cookies, by the way. Torn CCL. Do you have any experience from a, with a torn CCL? No, man. You know what? I've had um, my dog Gage actually recently got a soft tissue injury on his left shoulder. I didn't go to the vet. Usually when I have soft tissue injuries, I will just immediately, if I, the second I see a dog limping, especially with the sport dogs, happens a lot. They, they move too quickly, they tear something. Especially it's a danger when the dog is cold, as in like they haven't done anything for a while, like they're cold, they're lying in the car, whatever, and you let them out and immediately they take off or they start moving very suddenly. Very dangerous time for them to pull muscles. If you have a bigger dog, like a Preza or something like this, especially you have to be very careful about this, you must warm up the dog first before you progress. Um, uh, tendons really suck. When, when a dog breaks a tendon, sometimes it can be a career ending. I, I, I've seen, I have a lot of friends whose dogs have torn cruciate and the dog is done in done in any kind of competition once they tear a cruciate. Um, you can do the $5,000, $6,000 surgery and all the rehab. Usually at that point, once you've done that, the other cruciate breaks. My GSD does not care for food or treats. Strictly toy. Well, there you go. You know what your dog needs then. In the, don't use rewards that your dog doesn't find rewarding. Um, besides backing off when they're teething, how do you handle a German Shepherd dog under a year old with growing pains? I rest them when they're limping. Uh, I try to give them space. Like I don't leave them in the crate a lot. Uh, I do try to give them space. Um, but whenever I see a dog that's injured, I basically minimize any kind of uh, activity with that dog. I have had a fair few German Shepherds that have panicitis um, over the years, especially the bigger ones. I just leave them be. I let them get through it if necessary give them an anti-inflammatory um, usually it goes away and, and they're able to function normally what have you found to be the easiest way to make a dog a push and b stop chomping i have um some videos that i put up on how i teach grip development I strongly suggest you use those, um, watch those videos. What is the difference between real aggression and fear aggression? We've already kind of gone over that. It's intent, basically. What's your intent? Is your intent to just, you know, scare away the boogeyman and you really don't want any of it? Or is your intent, um, you know, to actually engage the guy, right? I watched this video. You know, there's this video out there. And this is a video that really you should all watch. It's one of those, like, kind of prank videos where there's, like, kid, um, there's, it's, I think it's like a Home Depot or something. And um, they have like this big display and something, it's like a Halloween kind of thing, pops out of the display and scares the kids. And like 95% of the kids run or jump or like freeze or drop whatever they're holding or whatever it is. And I'll probably be in that group. But there was one kid, this thing pops out, like this scary thing pops out and he just whacks it just right away. Bang, he whacked it. It scared and startled him. He just attacked it. That was his natural response, right? That's the difference. Making a better push bite. Yeah, I've already, guys, I've got a whole bunch of videos on bite development. You know why you have those problems? You have those problems because you skip steps, okay? Most people that skip steps develop um, grip issues and, and, and issues in the foundation because they're in such a hurry to put the sleeve on or the suit on. You cannot do that. Um, thanks. Again, guys, I really appreciate all the support. I bought a six-month-old German shirt, Malinois. I, I hope that's Malinois. I don't know what a Malinois is. And decided they didn't want to do any obedience training. I'm trying to teach him not to mouth when we play. Okay? 
well, you know, make it good to be good and bad to be bad. That's, that's about all I can tell you on the, on the internet here. Um, tell me more of the husky breed. No. <laughs> One of my trainers is actually... Um, she is, she loves huskies. She owns them. She does like the the dog sledding and stuff like this. I I have trained quite a few huskies. Um, man, they are they are uh, they are not the easiest dogs to obedience train. But once you've trained a few huskies and you've really said, "Listen, Mister Husky, we're going here," you see very quickly how how quickly those hus you you see the same behavior. They always have the same automatic responses. Most Huskies are very sensitive to pressure. They overreact, um, see a lot of resource guarding in the breed, um, and dog aggression is quite common. Huskies can be nasty customers if you don't know what you're doing with them. And then, you know, look, we've had a few that are quite pleasant, but you know, they're not definitely not my favorite dog to train. We've trained quite a few of them because they're quite a popular breed. Uh, I just wanna thank you so much for your videos. Um, oh, I'm glad you guys find some value in the videos, guys. I really do. I don't use the pronger. Well, I don't use the e-collar to make no in the beginning, right? Listen, any kind of meaning that you're looking to make. For me, I've always said this. I do not outsource my corrections. A lot of people are always looking for the magical device to outsource their corrections. In the beginning with me and the puppy... There's no e-collar, there's no prong collar. The puppy learns. When daddy says no, he means it. My three-year-old son learned the same thing, right? I love him, but he he had to learn. And I'm not ever gonna use a prong collar or e-collar with him, but it's up to me to bring him up to be a, uh, res a, 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 a safe member of society, a productive member of society, and part of that is learning what no means. He can't always go with whatever he wants. It's the same with your dog, all right? Stop looking to outsource your corrections. That's my best advice to you. In this day and age, the only, if there is really any acceptable way to correct your dog, the only way to correct your dog that's deemed societally acceptable is with a device. Prong collar, e-collar, whatever. People will still give you crap for it, but you're using something that's like made for it, right? I don't do that. I correct with this, I correct with this, I correct with that, I correct with this, I correct with this. There's many ways to correct the dog. I don't rely on devices exclusively to do it, right? People seem to ascribe ethical standards to one form of correction versus another. A correction is a correction. Now, of course, we never want to injure the dog. And by injure, I mean cause a physical physical harm to the dog you never want to do that and if you're doing that obviously you should not do that right this is this is a this is a bad thing you cannot do that that being said I'll give you an example I just corrected myself right it was moderately painful but there's no injury okay I can put a pinch collar on my neck I can do the same thing you watch that video I put two e-collars on. I gave myself 200. Okay, that was very physically uncomfortable. There was no damage to me. All right? Aversives are not something that you should ever limit to a device. If you do it, you will always be limited by that device. Now, there, of course, we get dogs all the time. They come in. They're too old, you know, like... They're too old, you know, to, to, to be doing things like that you would do with a puppy, for instance. I limit my aversives to things that only make sense to the dog. Let me put it to you like this. Um, and I don't make too many rules. The more rules the, you make, the more aversives you have to use, the more problems you can create and conflict you can create with your dog. In the beginning, especially with the dog, I have very few rules, but they're very clear. And because of that, when I use the aversives, they're very impactful, all right? So I guess that's really all I can say. It's, it's not about the device. Six month old check working line to ignore command sometimes. Well, yes, a lot of people, they get puppies 
Um, and they're very impressed with themselves because the puppy, here's the thing with little puppies, right? The puppies are always a little bit less confident, a little bit less secure than they will be when they're older. So what do they do? They stick close to mommy or daddy. So you tend to think that your training, whatever it is that you're doing, is working very well. When in reality, the dog's insecurity and, and inexperience is what keeps him or her close to you. It's their instinct. They got to stay with what they know and avoid what they don't, right? As they become older, more mature, more confident, they start to go out. And this is where this whole kind of, oh, he's a teenager now. It's not that he's a teenager. He's just more confident. Now he wants to go and see things for himself. He's a little bit less worried. So he feels comfortable enough to go out into the world. And then you're saying, oh, no, my training's not working anymore. Well, it was probably never really working very well. <laughs> so this is where you have to, again, I use a, a combination of motivation and obligation. And then the dog learns there are certain things that are obligatory. When I say come, you must come right six months old e-collar mm, be careful all right again i always am i i steer people away from aversives like or pressure i shouldn't say aversives because the e-collar can be used as a negative reinforcer it can be used as a punisher um you have to be careful right with the young dogs be sorry guys things done too soon maybe not in the most correct way um can cause a lot of problems so i'm always i always tell people be careful do i personally run the instagram for canine shield i'm one of them i'm one of the people yes you said you're in the early stages uh in the early stages let the dog work for the food but you've heard slot about german shepherds turning their stomachs oh you're saying because the dog's working for his food is going to be more likely to turn to flip his stomach no that's not true at all we really actually don't know what causes bloat there's just a lot of um, uh, speculation but not feeding them is not what causes it what's the best way to become a great breeder trainer I have a fantastic video on that I suggest you go back in my dog training channel and watch I found watching your videos also helps me train my kids uh-huh um, you'd be surprised I know it does it's the same concept kids and dogs are so similar a dog is basically like a, a, a cup like a, a toddler really with a lot more strength and um, you know I have a toddler right now it's just so funny watching the similarities and he's you know I shudder to think about what he would do if he was a dog because he'd be a lot stronger a lot faster <laughs> Thanks for answering my question. I'll go back through your videos. Okay, thank you. My dog fixates on other dogs. Now after harsh corrections, she won't lunge, won't approach. If I force her closer, she returns to lunging. Well, here's the thing, right? Number one, you should never be forcing your dog closer. What you've done is you've created enough of an aversive that the dog has learned, right, that certain things are not acceptable but the dog has still created a threshold where they're still willing to engage in that behavior when you're dealing with a dog who's who's fear aggressive towards other dogs it's important to make rules but also give the dog space if that makes sense so my rules are listen you're not allowed to engage in any aggression but if you choose to avoid that dog i'm going to allow you to do it i'm not going to force you like hey you got to be next to each other i don't do that nonsense if you want to avoid it's okay normally what I do is once they stop the init like the bad behavior fixation the aggression all that stuff right I'll engage the dog in play and then once the dog is comfortable playing with me I'll work closer and then if the dog has a maybe they have like some imaginary threshold in their brain and they're like okay you came within six feet now I'm going again I say okay well now you've got the consequence again so you must not do that and then the dog learns it's probably better to just play with daddy and to stop uh, you know having these having these uh, outbursts with the other dog and also i need to prevent that dog from doing anything to my dog so that my dog doesn't have a bad experience so it's a two-way street favorite german shepherd breeders staatsmacht stefan stefan he's one of my favorites in the um, german shepherd breeder in the united states um, because of the consistency that he gets in his program his dogs aren't for everybody uh, but if you're looking for a competition dog I think Stefan breeds some very good dogs um, 
Any advice for a reactive dog who's very responsive with the choke chain without stimuli? Um, those kinds of questions are always a little bit difficult. Um, you know, like the dog is reactive and then the second, uh, or sorry, the dog's responsive to whatever tool you're using, then the second another dog comes in the picture. Um, look into bonking. Look into that. You might find something that you that you want. You might find the answer to your question there. Uh, how do you give corrections to ma malis, especially as puppies? I'm worried if I raise... Listen, um, with Malinois, they are very sensitive, um, and they can develop good responses um, and bad responses at an equal rate of speed. So you have to be careful with the Malinois. Um, there's no clear advice other than take it easy, Try to manage the dog. So if you know in a certain situation that the dog, the, the puppy is more prone to misbehaving, try to avoid that situation um, and then seek professional help. Those are not user-friendly dogs. Malinois are not dogs where you want to make a lot of mistakes. Um, seek professional help and make sure you're getting the, the mentorship and guidance that you need to get when you have a dog like that. Otherwise, you can cause a lot of problems with the Malinois. H A Z. It's short for Hajar, which is actually a Kurdish name. You said I have just begun displaying aggression to another family dog, and correct with a method you know he understands in a safe area. Uh, family, so like dog on dog, where they live together is a whole different kettle of fish. Usually, dog on dog aggression when they live in the same house is because um, there's a very poor management um, situation and the dogs are being allowed to compete for various resources, affection, food, place on the bed, so on and so forth. And usually one dog has begun displaying, um, you know, very disrespectful behavior to another dog. The humans have ignored it or didn't notice it. And now the other dog feels like they're in a situation where they, they have to fight for their rights, so to speak. Uh, so you have to manage that situation. You have to make it clear to both the dogs that it's completely unacceptable to engage in any kind of physical violence with one another, so on and so forth. Um, that's the quick answer. I've been watching your vids. Now I have dog to walk completely off leash. Nice. With the use of an e-collar. Thank you. I'm Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to hear that. And um, good on you, man. Uh, my dog bites the snout of other dogs. Does this have any meaning in dog language? Yeah, go away. Um, when you teach your young GSD to out, does a slow out first few weeks become faster with daily practice? Um, yeah, so for me, like I'm doing something maybe a little bit different than the average person would do. Um, generally speaking, uh, most people, look, if you're going to do an out, do an out, right? You say out, pop, 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 he drops it. You let him have it again and so on and so forth i wouldn't be so worried if he's chewing it a few times then dropping it um but after a period of time yeah we need to clean that up my dog have an accident now in some places he is scared yeah what am i munching on cookies tim hortons when you teach uh my dog has an accident that's kind of a very broad question. When I have a fearful, I say to the dog two things. I can't control whether you like it or Sorry. I say, if you're afraid of the stairs, we're going up the stairs whether you like it or not. Um, you know, I hope you feel good about it. But if you don't, you're still going to do it. And we're just going to do it a bunch of times until you're able to push yourself through that um, obstacle. Um, once the dog's able to do it, um, I then try to add play and or something desirable to the whole thing so that the dog has a good time. Uh, are dogs in heat allowed to go to your class? Yes. Why wouldn't they be? How do you deal with people who look down on you for using an e-call in public? You know, a lot of people have this. I traveled across Canada recently. A lot of people always talking about other people. I notice a lot of my female clients get picked on a little bit. And I think that's just um, sexism at work. And I'm not someone who who su subscribes to the woke ideology. So please, don't 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 give me any of that. But I will say, I've never, 
maybe once in my life, somebody has, has given me crap about the use of the e-collar and I send them on their way as they deserved. Um, nobody bothers me. I correct my dogs in public. I take dogs in public that I'm training and I correct them. So it's not just that they're wearing the e-collar. I actually have used it, right? And I've used it in a, in a subtle way and I've also used it in a, in a pretty significant way. People don't bother me. Uh, but I, I do have some, some female clients that complain that they're being bothered. And again, I think that's people listen. They see a woman, she's with her dog. Oh, let me, let me tell her what I think. Nonsense. Don't put up with it. Send them on their way. I have two dogs. My male dog attacks everyone. Or even for even looking at my female dog he is doing it to protect her with his tail down um, well he wouldn't be afraid if he was doing it to protect her it's either a case of resource guarding or um, or most likely what it is is it's just fear aggression and you know he sees the uh, he sees people in close proximity and he's reacting. Maybe our female dogs there, and you're just assuming that's what it is. Um, I don't you you don't correct fear. Remember, you correct aversive responses to fear. So yeah, I would definitely correct the aggressive behavior for sure. I would make it very clear to him that's not acceptable in my presence. That he must never behave like this. And then again, I would work towards stabilizing his emotions in those specific situations where I say okay this is an uncomfortable situation you're either going to do the wrong thing in which case there's going to be a consequence or you're going to do the right thing in which case there's also going to be a consequence it's going to be a good one any tips our shepherd has redirected towards us a few times and nipped while reacting to another dog just shakes off the e-collar yep that's a very common one so e-collar is not the solution for that uh, the solution for that is the dog needs to learn that number one just as I correct the dog for becoming aggressive or reactive towards another dog I will also correct any react redirection towards me and the dog quickly learns that that's not a solution either you know remember what I said you need to have another level you need to have another level and if you don't have another level your dog will learn that really quickly um, look into slip leads or dominant dog collars. You might find something useful there. My German Shepherd loses her mind when meeting new people. Any suggestions? Stop letting your dog meet new people. You know how many new people my dogs meet? Maybe like two a year. My dogs are not for other people to pet. I'm not running a petting zoo. Stop allowing your dogs to self-satisfy by engaging with strangers. That's why your dog gets so excited. Because they've learned, they place a lot of value in that interaction with strangers. Same way with dogs that are reactive, right? They place a lot of um, stress in the, the potential that there's going to be an interaction with a stranger. Stop allowing that. Minimize that. Uh, talk talk to us about rank drive. What does it mean for protection training? It's rare. It's rare. There's not too many of dogs like this. Uh, if you ever want to see a dog that has real rank drive that motivates him, there's a dog on my channel. I think it's called Strongest Malinois in North America. Dog is named Rex. He is a combination of KMPV and NVBK lines. He's getting old now. I think he's like 12, something like this. I bred to this dog once. I bred a German Shepherd to this dog. And that German Shepherd, um, that that German Shepherd was the mother of Gage. It was my first litter that I had with her. It was actually a cross between Malinois and German Shepherd. Because if you know anything about my breeding program, I breed for me. I don't breed for other people. I don't care about, you know, a lot of my, most of my breedings are purebred German Shepherd. But this breeding, I, I knew I would get some good working dogs out of it. And I got one fantastic working dog. His name was Arco. And you can see Arco, um, I used him in a pro video you'll see Arco that's him at a year old doing those things um, 
I think there's another video called Decoy POV. Watch that video, that's Arco as well. I kept Arco's full sister. I bred her to Onyx. Those puppies are on the ground now. So that's a dog that has rank drive. The dog is motivated. His aggression comes from a place where it's not prey drive by itself. It's not defensive drive. The dog perceives you as challenging his position as the number one guy in wherever place he is. And he is biting you in a very dominant way. It's hard to explain, it's hard to describe unless you're in the suit, unless you're feeling the dog, unless you're looking into his eyes and you're seeing his behavior. You know it's not prey drive. You know it's different. Dogs that are in prey act a certain way. Dogs that are in defense act a certain way. A rank dominant dog is like nothing you've ever seen. Those dogs are rare. Um, and I find that they generally, um, they don't produce as well in the wealthy box. But when you run into one, it's a truly special experience. IPO versus PSA. Seven months old German Shepherd getting ready for outside training, being following you. Thank you. Um, IPO is much more, there's much more competition and there's much more resources available for IGP, as it's called now. Um, IPO is a trainer sport. It's very complex. Um, it's, I think, more difficult uh, for newbies. Uh, PSA requires a certain kind of dog. If you have that kind of dog, great. If not, good luck to you. Um, IPO is a little bit more friendly in the dog department. You can have a dog maybe um, that's a little bit more flexible. You won't make it the top levels of IPO, but you'll, you can get your three with a dog that's not even very good. Um, with IPO, a lot of the people that hate on it, they don't understand. There's getting your three and then there's competing with your three. And if you want to be in the competitions, if you want to be at the top level with the top trainers, you need a very special dog and you need fantastic training and you can't have made too many mistakes early on. Otherwise, you probably will never be on the high levels. That's IPO. But that being said, you can still go and trial and get your three, right? With a dog that's not very good. PSA, you're never going to get your PSA three with a dog that's not very good. At least I don't think so anyways. Appreciate the love, guys. Pros and cons of band dogs versus shepherds in personal protection. Well, it depends on the band dog. There's no, there's no like, there's no universal uh, standard for band dogs. You've got dogs that are basically just glorified mutts, and then you've got dogs that are part of a um, purpose-bred program. Um, you know where they're really actually paying close attention to what they produce. I've only ever seen one person with band dogs that impressed me. Um, he's on Facebook. I think his name is Scott Bully Vision in the UK. It looks like he has some fantastic band dogs. I think they're like Malinois Pressa Crosses or something. Um, and he's using obviously very good stock because the dogs that he shows anyways on, the, um, on social media are fantastic from what I saw. I have a two-year-old French uh, bulldog that goes ballistic when the TV is on with the e-collar. Yeah, look into bonking and the place command. Fear aggression, have reactivity always. Not sure what that means. Looking forward to using your boarding train later in the year. Big fan of your approach. Thank you. In the Toronto area. Uh, no, I don't know any trainers in the Toronto area would recommend. You know, a lot of people ask me all the time. Yeah, Lee Robinson, as far as I, I don't know much about the old band dog community, all right? Um, but uh, I do know that there's a lot of big talkers in there and not a lot of big showers, so keep that in mind. Are you going to do online course? Yes, I said I would. Is it safe to start a German Shepherd in protection and bite work if the dog is in a household with small children? Well, if he has a good temperament, yes, absolutely. Your The, the uh, protection work, if it's... If it's done by anybody that has any have a decent clue as to what they're doing, it's not going to create any difference in your dog's fundamental temperament. Can you explain what K and PV Malinois are and how they're different from other Malinois lines? I don't know. Can I do that in two minutes? K and PV Malinois. So there's FCI Malinois. There's NVBK Malinois. There's K and PV Malinois. Now there's PSA Malinois, and there's um. Uh, you know, so FCI Malwa 
are basically, we basically call IGP bred Malinois FCI Malinois. Uh, but really, there's also show line Malinois. Show Malinois useless, avoid at all costs. F um, IGP Malinois, you can get anything from really good to really bad. Um, be careful. Well, listen, that's the, that's true for any dog. I shouldn't say that uh, because it's such a broad term. But the uh, the FCI Malinois also include uh, French ring dogs as well. So French ring dogs tend to be smaller. They tend to be a little bit more sensitive. Um, I don't really like the grips personally, but I know there are dogs within those lines that have good grips. It's always about individuals. You know, we speak in broad generalities. You run into problems. Same with the KMPV dogs. Listen, I've worked KMPV dogs that have very uh, KMPV PH1, perfect score, the fantastic dogs, right? Like fantastic scores and, and whatever else. The dog was very unimpressive, right? My IG, It wouldn't be good enough for me to, to do IGP with. So everything is hyped you know in the dog world you have to be careful i've also worked cam pv dogs that are fantastic dogs right like rex the um the rank dog that i was talking about different lines right cam pv dogs tend to not have any um, papers over there that some breeders use some don't they don't care about papers the cam pv program is basically a program designed um to certify dogs in holland um, they get the cam PV certificate, and then the idea is that they be sold to a police department. So it's not really something that the idea isn't really to compete against other people. Now I understand that it's becoming more of a competition, whereas IGP the idea is to compete, right, and to breed your dogs. In cam PV, it's more get the certificate, sell the dog. But in reality, a lot of the dogs are even sold before they have the certificate, right? So it's not so much a breeding title or even, um, you know, a sport title. It's more like a certification kind of deal. That was the idea of it. Maybe I'm butchering it a little bit. Um, I've had a fair, I've had quite a few dogs that, that have those lines in them or, or have all of those lines and, you know, they're dogs like anything else, you know, it's, it, the thing you have to understand about IGP is it's a game of drive transitions. The dog has to switch drives. So a lot of these dogs, maybe that are bred for other sports, they only have one drive and it's basically prey and then they really struggle in the other drives. They're not so good there. So that's that's something that I would say, you know, because in IGP, there's a guarding component. So you need to have good guarding. Um, and that requires a little bit of nerve, I think. Um, we have our first Ger German Shepherd Lolly trained because of your YouTube videos. Okay, I appreciate that truth clips. Um, Wine's constantly in the crate no matter what. Any suggestions? Depends on the whining, right? New text message from Kristen. That's my wife. <laughs> Depending on, depends on the whining. Is there whining like, you know, very low level whining or is it like, like screaming, you know, like he's screaming in there. If he's screaming in there, then I will mark no. I will go to the crate. I'll smack the crate. Don't do that, right? Then I will leave. Why is he crying? He's crying for your attention. So if you go and you give him positive attention, you're reinforcing the crying. If you go and give him negative attention, you're punishing the crying. You must think of it like this. Um, book. Yeah. What's my opinion on line breeding? If you're using good dogs, it's a, it's the only way to actually breed properly, in my opinion. Maybe a book on obedience. Yeah, for sure. We'll see. You know, a lot of, a lot of irons in the fire, so to speak. Okay, guys. Well. I'm going to call it a day. Um, it was nice to talk to all of you. It's fun trying something different. Hope you enjoyed the uh, the live. And um, hey, follow me on Instagram if you're not following me on Instagram. Shield underscore canine. Appreciate it. Oh, I just read one last comment. I have coyotes in the area. Does personal protection training provide the dog with an edge? You know, I'm going to say this. I have a client who recently called me. I sold him a personal protection dog. Um, he had a bear encounter, and the bear had some cubs with her. And I guess she got a little bit nasty. He sent his dog on her. The dog and the bear got into a, a fight. And long story short, the dog ran the bear. Um, this is a two-year-old dog from my breeding program. Um, and the dog ended up with 10 punctures in his chest. But thank God he's okay. And, um, you know, so look, a good dog is a good dog and he will protect you. All right, guys. Nice to talk to all of you and uh, stay tuned for more.